You're tuned in to RX Radio. Hold on, let me pull up the tag. Are we going to do it? Oh, yeah. we're going to shout out the person. Ah, maybe we do this as a segment. Look at us. I like this. Eight years in. First of, I don't know, I feel like we did this years ago. We did. did we do a Q&A yeah. episode years ago? Yeah, I think we've done a couple of them over the years. It's It's been a minute, though. It's been it a feels minute. lazy, but yeah. if people like it, I will continue to consider doing it. <laughs> It, you know, it makes the podcast a little bit interactive, right? Because it's a very one-sided medium, which is like the way I prefer it, to be honest. <laughs> <That's really awesome. laughs> Everyone shut the fuck up. We're talking. Yeah. yeah. I put that question box up and I got a lot of dumb answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. this episode Q&A. Yeah. Brought uh, to you by gonna... the Violent Patients out of Toronto. Oh. Yeah, oh boy! I, you know, of course, he asked the good question. He asked the good question. Uh, should we go through some of the dumb questions first? Let's do this. If we're going to make this a segment, I need to, I need to teach people what is a dumb question. So let's oh. sift through a couple of them. And if you're out there and you're listening and you're guilty of this, uh, you're going to get roasted. All and right. then violent patients, our homeboy, you're going to get uh, you're going to get the leading role here in the episode. We'll just go top to bottom. So, Education, degree versus no degree in coaching. Maybe we rapid fire this. Can uh, we do, uh, can we uh, do that? Are, so we're going to rapid fire these questions? All, All the right. dumb ones? All right, go. Uh, well, I mean, clearly you don't need it. No, you don't. It's based off ability and your – it's off – let's see. Uh, your ability to perform in the industry and create results versus your ability to network and allow people to know that you can do that well. Wow. Well done. I'm not going to try and up that. Nailed it. Sick. Moving on. All right. I'm going to lob one up for you. Will, will a sub Beep. four second 40 ever happen? Is it even physically possible? Dude, we're at four two right now. Like high four twos. Worthy. Ran a f- um, I think it's possible by someone who's not a football player. Okay. Right. Like, I, doubt, I doubt that kid will have much of a career. He was skinny, huh? 165 pounds. Oh, he wants to play football in the NFL. There's a couple. There's a couple wideouts out there. Uh, Smitty, Devontae Smith, Slim Reap. He's about that. He's about that size. Wow. But yeah, but when there's 11 dudes on the field and they're all trying to take your head off, that 165 moves a little bit cautiously around there. Robbie Anderson, chosen Anderson, pretty small. But yeah, I, I think you could probably see someone, a pure sprinter, do it. Mm. But I doubt. You're gonna. You start to run in a carrying capacity. Like that person would have to be a little bit lighter, with probably a little bit lankier proportions, um, yeah. and just can't be subject to the the residual wear and tear of football. Yeah, that's a bad question. I like it. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. What type of athlete person would you like to train, which you have not trained already? Hmm. Like sport. I'm assuming the question is. It says athlete or person. So. Oh, maybe like an individual. Do you have anyone? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to take him, take him in on that. Um, no one, not a specific person, but I think um, wrestling, like strength and conditioning for wrestling, is something I'd like to be more involved in because that's kind of like taking a full circle back to my roots, how I got into this shit, and it's just notoriously trash. It's garbage. So that's something that I'd like to be more involved in at some point in my career. Mm. I think I don't. My answer would be at a level where the person where it would make a difference. Like give me like a yeah. like a mid skilled athlete that if they had a bigger engine, I feel like that's like my default. But there's also some like selfish high performers that like I think Tyree Kill would be a super interesting guy to train. Like obviously, can you make the best better? But can you make good people great? Yeah, like basically anywhere where you can move the needle. Um, I mean, I'm default drawn to football. Uh, yeah, I'd probably stick there. I, I'm sure if I thought about it a little bit deeper, I, I would come up with a different answer. But in the interest of brevity, yeah, I think that's a good answer. I don't because I I get that. Like, I don't necessarily want to work with high high performers because you're you're just kind of holding their hand and making sure they don't like trip over a dumbbell at that point. Right. But people that like want to train and like honestly, that's my answer. I think anyone that's invested, like, I fuck with you. All right. Um... I assume this is talking. This is a weightlifter. Can we talk about the adrenaline dump and can it be controlled? So, context for anyone that's not a weightlifter is like between snatch and clean and jerk. Like people get super amped up for the snatch, and then 
they'll finish the snatch session, you have like a 10, 15 minute break in between, and then they'll just fucking crash hard, like energy levels before the clean and jerk. Um, I'd say that's more about just like controlling, like uh, uh, to use one of Killian's old favorite words, arousal levels. Um, like big boner guy, big, yeah, yeah. Just don't get too hard for the snatches. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just but controlling like the amount of stimulation in between, like dispersing caffeine intake between both lifts, uh, not getting too amped up, like keeping headphones in, keeping the head down, like trying not to like give into the stimulus. I think is the best thing that I've found, and also like. Um, uh, some sort of snack or like like lay down in between lifts, like eat something small, drink enough water, and just don't be a bitch. Yeah, something along the same lines. It's really more of like a, it, it, it's better to have a ability to fluctuate between a, a, a mediocre sympathetic state and a mediocre parasympathetic state than just be all gas, mm, right? Yeah. So a lot of that comes down to how people train as well. Like, yeah. Are you staying hype all session while you train? Probably going to have a default to stay hype all day in a comp. And it's like, that's just too long of a day. Like powerlifting is no different, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Powerlifting is probably even worse than weightlifting. Because you have three lifts and they're a lot heavier. Yeah. And there's more people and it's run by stupider people and no one's wearing like blazers and shit. It's bad. It's all bad. Yeah. It's like the middle of a metal concert too. Yeah. Um, Oof. This one's a little personal, but I'm going to put it out there. Hell, this is the streets. <laughs> not in a happy relationship and wanting to leave. Any advice? You're not to me. You're not that unhappy because you already would have left. You wouldn't ask two retards on the internet. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you're asking my advice. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my that's... advice is to ask someone better than me. That's yeah. That's a tough. That's a tough position to be in. But at the same time, there's a. I don't know if you, this is not where you get advice. Imagine if we did a relationship episode. Oh, oh my God. Oh, so and many people would have such so, bad advice. Oh, yeah. They'd have a laugh, though. They'd have a laugh. <laughs> Holy. Ooh, we'll, we'll drop that one one day. No. We'll, we'll, quite literally the last episode we ever do, <laughs> like on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. At least I'm in a position now where there's no one to be upset with me if they hear it. So it's like, uh, oh. I bet. We did an episode on the hybrid podcast where Killian talked about the current girl he was dating and something to the, anyway, this is, you know what? I don't want to put his business in the streets. So I'm not going to, but if you ever go back and because find it, it, it's not living on the internet forever already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you want to laugh, that's the best relationship podcast episode you'll ever want to hear. Shout out Killian Hamilton. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> moving on. Moving on promptly. Um, more banter on how we're going to remove boomers from the fitness industry. You know what? At this point, I think they're just going to do it to themselves. Yeah. I don't know. Right? I think I they're just, losing a lot of cred. Yeah. It's pretty bad. I think we just um, put all the plant-based supplements. We, we take them and we just put lead in them. <laughs> the old lead-based. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. I uh, I don't know. I, I, I hope it happens. So, you know what I think it is? I think we're at a point now. I was talking to uh, this marketing guy the other day. Um, we're at a point now where I think people need to stop aspiring to be on Joe Rogan or be on these boomer podcasts and start to realize that there's a mantle to take up soon, that there is a next wave coming, right? Whether it's Chris Williamson, whether it's Alex O'Connor, like there's another Rogan coming. Right, and there's another sphere of influence in that group. It seems like the the singular node inside that is like a relatively impartial, high volume podcast, and they have sort of liberated and given credence to these people as experts in their field. So rather than trying to like usurp them by conventional means, you sort of let the ironic thing is you just let time sort of sort them out. And rather than trying to like go to their level and compete, it's like, no, no, you're, you're a node in a network of peers your age that will get older. And then as long as you don't turn into a pussy, then when we are the age that the boomers are out yelling a bunch of random shit, we'll be a bunch of cool old dudes that are still jacked. <laughs> and everyone that listens to us will be jacked and the world will be a better place. So I think that's an honest answer is like, you know, yeah, sure. Lead based, uh, uh, vegan protein, yeah. um, maybe turn all of their ruck vests into suicide vests. And it's like <laughs> <blowing>. <laughs> yeah. 
they just start blowing themselves up. Which, like, hey, you, that yeah. one's free. That one's free. You take that one. <laughs> so yeah, you're, not, you're not hard if you don't have a suicide vest, <laughs> right? Yeah. You're, oh, anyways. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, this goes on the internet forever. I'm going to show myself up. Yeah. Mm. At what point does uh, freedom of speech end and terroristic threats begin? I don't think I we're don't there yet, but we can, we can take it there. That's for the courts to decide. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, that's why. That's why. That's why. Realistic answer is, you know, we we are going to be their age, but I don't. Being a boomer is a state of mind, right? Like, there's a, there's a lot of twenty year old boomers out there. It's just like I think it's a, it's a point of authority, and like you know what? There's I was talking. I forgot. I was talking to Muscular Bill. Mm. William Elias the Oof. other day, and yes. we were talking about, um, you know, I felt, I, I feel old. I've always felt old, but I'm only now getting the credit for it. So there's a, there's a movie that I really like called Bullet Train. At the end of it, there's this old Japanese cat, and he's, like, fighting this young person or whatever. And he, like, looks at the young person, and he goes, there's only one thing that we both know for sure, is that I've survived more shit than you have. <laughs> and it's like... <laughs> I feel that way at 34. <laughs> Give me another 20 years and an Instagram account that hasn't been suspended. Look out. Right? <laughs> like I'm coming over the top. So, uh, yeah, I think it just we beat them with time, which is how they're currently losing. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Yeah. And also just being discriminant in the information that you consume. Like there's some things that old people can say that apply to everyone. But when it comes to fitness and exercise, like – a lot of people, the older they get, they get pigeonholed into the way that they have to work out because of the shit that they've done when they were our age. And that mm. might be me. I'm going to try not to be a big bitch the older I get. But I guess we never really know. I'm just hoping I die before then. But also, like, if you're consuming information, be cognizant of the source that you're getting it from and how you're applying it, right? If, if you're 25, 30 years old, like, you probably shouldn't be working out the same way as a 60-year-old dude that's fucking broken. Mm. So there's that. Yeah, that sense it started off with be discriminant in the way. And I thought you were going to be say be discriminatory. And I was like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> let's, let's, let's hear about uh, Let's hear about real quick. What is I, there? Yes, discriminant. Right, discriminant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ageism, is that what it is? You know what? Fuck that. I've been on the other side of that so many times. Yeah. That I don't give a fuck if I just shut down every old person that opens their mouth. Because yeah. the number of times that I've been shut down for being younger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah the internet's afraid. really fucking that up because now there's like teenagers that make millions of dollars on TikTok. Yeah. A be ages to anyone that's not your age. <laughs> I think that's true. That's pure ageism. <laughs> that's age elitism. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, that's if how you're the, younger the, than me. The you're stupid. If <laughs> I was really hoping you weren't going to draw that parallel, I was like, "Don't do it! Don't do it! Don't do it!" Ah, <laughs> fuck, he did it. I mean, that's that's objective. I'm just uh, saying. <laughs> yikes! All right, what do we got next? <laughs> Can we still do this? I don't know. We'll keep going. Um, top client wins, client losses, and what did you learn from each? Mm, tough i mean anytime a client gets hurt but that's yeah. the that's the territory you play in. So dan tore his bicep that was pretty bad i uh, was, wasn't thrilled off that um yeah a couple of big name athletes sustaining pretty nasty or like missing a diagnosis or something i'd say that's like probably a big l yeah um but the biggest thing you learn is like well i'll never miss that diagnosis again yeah that's for I, sure I think one for me, like a principle I've taken out of the L's is I'm way more, especially with higher end clients, like top performing athletes, I'm way quicker to get imaging now. Oh, yeah. If you have access to it, like why why leave any doubt? Yeah. Yeah. That's something where I was I had a little bit of an ego <clears throat> earlier and I was like, no, nah, we can start this out. We'll see if we can move the needle. And then like you get a little bit, you're know, feeling a little bit better and you're like, oh, we might be onto something. And then you, something happens. You're like, hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay, got it. I'm going to yeah. take my place over here in the, in the stupid corner. So, um, yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, I've my client wins a little bit different. It's it's someone that I still work with today, and I've been working with for about eight years now. And this is like well, all time. It's going to be hard for anyone to ever top this client. Um, <clears throat> the gym that I'm in, his this kid was 14 at the time. His parents brought him in. Uh, and like just had no idea. They were just kind of frustrated. He he's 
six months off of a brain surgery at this point. Um, used to be an athlete, like played baseball, um, did like racing, like raced cars. Um, I think he played football as well and uh, had a brain tumor. He had surgery because of the brain tumor and lost a lot of neurological input to half of his body. <clears throat> like could, literally couldn't walk a straight line without falling over. Um, <clears throat> and they're like, we don't know. Like PT said that for him to get stronger might help. Like, is there anyone here that can help him? And they just like pointed him my way. And I'm like, uh, to be honest, I have no idea. I don't know if I can help him at all, but I will do my best and I'll try and start training. Like really, really frustrating for both of us for the first probably a couple of years we worked together. Like his parents, like, like you're coming in and like, just kept coming back, kept showing up. <clears throat> I've been working with this kid for eight years now. He runs like a sub eight minute mile deadlifts, like 300 pounds for reps, like, He's, he's a fucking stud. Now, like, kid's like Jack now. He was, like, this scrawny kid when I started working with him. Now he's, like, probably 6'2", like, 205, and, like, fucking, he's stacked. He's, he's got some muscle on him. So that's, like, the biggest in terms of, like, what you're saying, where you can make a difference. Like, that's the biggest dif- I find it hard to think that I'll ever make a difference bigger than that in someone's life in my training career. Uh, aside from, like, I mean, like you're saying, like, working from with someone to, like, get them into the NFL where they're getting, like, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars that's pretty fucking life-changing but that's like for sure like my biggest client win that, that i've ever had so that was sick client loss i've had a couple misdiagnoses uh, i missed like a torn acl once that was like oh that one kind of haunts me yeah um yeah outside of that i haven't had too many like crazy crazy losses i a, a lot of it's just managing expectations. I feel yeah. like if, if you learn that lesson early on, then it makes it a lot harder to fuck up because like you're just being transparent. It's like I, I don't know. And if you admit that you don't know, then they can't expect you to like do the thing that, you know, is anything more than that. Yeah. I think my biggest, w- I caught a VBA once, which is like, that's a big win. Ooh, that's a yeah. big win. <laughs> Cause, cause, that's, Cause that's, there's this big, biggest wins are avoiding the biggest L's. Yeah, that's like yeah, those are your biggest sure. wins. Self preservation sure. is the biggest win. So that, those of you listening who don't know what a VBA is, a vertebral basilar uh, artery aneurysm, or vertebral basilar aneurysm. Yeah, there's someone who was in my office who was essentially came in because they're having neck pain. Uh, the neck pain was coming from a dissected artery in their neck, and uh, that's the that's the case that goes nuclear. And someone goes, oh, you're, you know, you don't do your due diligence. You don't do your neuros. You don't do understand your history. And you just like start twisting people's head around. And then the next thing you know, they have a stroke. So whenever there's a chiropractor that gets accused of giving, causing a stroke, it's like, well, no, it's like likely the person was having the event, which provoked them to go in to see someone for neck pain as chiropractors are more commonly the preferred choice of managing neck pain in some demographics. Uh, and fit the bill, female, oral contraceptive, not super active, uh, headaches, just crazy neuro symptoms, photophobia, like a, a, a kind of an aversion to light, uh, eyes watering, couldn't track well, nystagmus, dizzy, nausea, like heavy, heavy neuro symptoms. And it was yeah. just like, um, a, a key word, I don't really know, but I know enough to know that like, and I think like I, you know, documented, I think you should go into like a urgent care like right now. And they did and they did an MRA and they caught it and all was well. And so that, that's the biggest win is avoiding else like self-preservation living because if I would, because I wouldn't have been had the opportunity to stack up another dub in my career. Right. Right. Yeah. If I get fucking sued and stripped of my license and all that stuff, it's like, well, the, the there's no more chance for any, any win. So yeah, that's that's mine. Fuck yeah. Um, all right. This is this is a statement. Hit piece journalism and culture. Hit piece and culture, both in quotes. So you know what this is coming off of, right? You know it's, you know the context of this? Uh so not really. I saw your post and that's about and like the the Huberman um like I don't know, just fucking seven girls a day post, which like hey, if you want relationship advice, maybe go to him. <laughs> <laughs> I just I what bothers me. So I think the funny thing is you and I have a unique vantage point to this. I, I'm remiss to call it a problem, but <laughs> no, that sounded so bad. No, but okay, I'm, shut up. <laughs> is we both 
as you still and I previously lived and worked in the Silicon Valley, where it's like, I don't know if anyone knows until you've been in the Valley, what it's like to live in a place where everyone is so smart. Yeah, right. Like being around really smart people is it's a very unique experience. Like you go back to your hometown or I go back to my hometown after living in the valley. You're like, wow, like it is just the highest concentration of like high IQ people on the probably on the planet. Right? Yeah. Outside of some sort of, you know, the Ivy League school or something like that. But even then, I think you're, you're still weeding out for the top of the top performers in the Silicon Valley. Yeah. So in going through that, it was really just a you were reading it and like I wasn't at all surprised by the behavior. Like it actually reminded me a little bit of Oppenheimer. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if you've if you've seen the movie or like if you've ever read the book American Prometheus, it's, uh, you know, he, he's he's clearly brilliant and he's not parading around to be Jay Shetty or anything like that. Right. Like he's just a guy who's smart. Like this guy can remember every sort of, you know, neurophysiological pathway of every, you know, s lobe of the cerebrum and the peripheral nervous. That, like he, he what he's going to remember f six girls, dogs names. And everyone's like, of course he was able to do this. Are you joking me? Like <laughs> that, that was, I, I don't know. It's like, to me, the article read as if this person had never met someone who was high functioning autistic before. Mm -mm. Like, and I'm not being disparaging at all, but when you watch a Huberman Lab podcast for three and a half hours and my man just doesn't blink, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you think he's, you know, he's, he's a, I, I don't know. It, it was, it was tough to read and like the backlash from it and Sauger's article posts or whatever was like, you know, it was clearly a orchestrated hit piece against the guy who, and I think this is what gets lost in all of it. As much as I maybe disagree with some of the people that he puts on on blast, I respect his right to do it and still have a private life that is devoid of prying eyes of some bullshit journalist because he does have a net positive. Yeah, I don't. I'll be honest. I don't know the whole situation, so I won't comment on it. But like the entire like culture around just like slandering people just because they can, it's bullshit. I mean, it's like, I'm not going to tell anyone how to live their life or what they're doing is right or wrong unless they're like crossing very clear lines. Like, don't hurt people. Try not to be a piece of shit. And like, you're probably fine. So I don't know if he, what was his thing? He was just like with a bunch of girls. Yeah, it got into like really intimate details of relationships he was having as far as like, oh, he yelled at me. It was like, really? That's where we're at? And like, look, I don't condone raising a voice to a significant other, especially as a male. I think it's probably not the greatest move and maybe you're not the best at communicating, but he's not, we don't pay him to be the best communicator, right? Right. Like, you know, it's not the value he brings to the world. And it's like, why isn't he allowed to be flawed? Like, he's really good and polished in the way that the society like takes from him and the way that he profits and makes his money. But why does he too? What if he was bad at parallel parking? Does he have to be good at parallel parking? Right. He's yeah. a good scientist, but does he have to be good at everything? Like he never claimed to be a a, a relationship guru or anything like that like he's just a scientist and again like at that level you have to understand the type the speck of person that takes up a throne that he has right at an institution like like i worked at stanford university right and i could tell you what it's like inside those walls yeah. right people just running around counting mustard packets like there's a lot of high functioning people going on inside that and it's like you know, okay, so he didn't show up to Thanksgiving dinner to one of his six girlfriends. It's like, I last I checked, that wasn't a crime. Yeah. Is it, you know, maybe not the best, sure, but it's like, man, who gets to call those shots? What are, you, what are the skeletons in your closet that you have a moral high ground that you can start writing? And what honestly what gets me about this, and I don't know if it's an angle that I really want to take, but the article was written by someone who had reached out in hoping to write like a positive spin piece on him. Uh... And I'm not going to bring the sexism into it, but I feel like there is a little bit of an angle of like, because his audience primarily is men and he has a net positive for men. And I feel like, it, you know, 
just seeing, and not that it necessarily matters, but I feel like it was, it turned into how dare you ignore me. Huberman ignored me. Andrew Schultz put me in a text thread with Huberman and be like, yo, this guy would be sick on the podcast, ghosted. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I did not expect him to ever respond. I could pull it up on my phone right now. And it's like, of, he's busy. He's busy doing the thing that the world is benefiting from. And it's like, not that I think he's the Dalai Lama, but like at a certain point, it's like, let the guy do his fucking job. Leave him alone. Yeah. Especially when morality is not really, I don't know. There, it doesn't have a direct impact on what he's doing, right? He's, get, he's spreading information, right? If he's, you know, if he's a piece of shit, if he's like really a terrible person, like, yeah, all right, maybe, maybe this guy shouldn't get as much clout and like, even sponsored athletes like Nike will withdraw from contracts if athletes do shitty things. Like, okay, maybe we shouldn't praise these people in a specific way, but like he's still spreading a lot of good information and I'm sure a lot of good is going to come out of it. So I don't know. Take, take from it what you will. Like I don't look at the guy like a role model in any way, really. I just look at him as, as a resource. Uh, well, I think for two things. I need to fact check myself. The Dalai Lama is probably the worst comparison because wasn't he sucking on kids' tongues and shit? Be mad at the Dalai Lama for like licking kids' tongues. That's a guy we go to for morality. If the Dalai Lama had seven broads on the run, okay. And also too, like, I think this story only fortifies his audience. It might alienate a hyper feminist right. group right, that right, doesn't. Right. But every forty-five year old that goes, man. This guy had the energy for seven women. Are you joking me? I'm getting out in the sun. I'm avoiding coffee the first 90 minutes of the day. Hubie, Hubie, what else you got for me, dog? Like, this yeah. is like, if anything, that's just like maybe guerrilla marketing. Maybe, maybe he Man. was like paying these girls to like say this shit off the side. But this guy, I don't know. I, like, that was like, that should have been the article of the, I'm going to get like Marshall the Photoshop, the New Yorker. <laughs> Just Huberman <laughs> with the button up, and then just this guy fuck. <laughs> oh, oh shit! Christ. Yeah. All right, moving on. Uh, this is a throwback. Neon gym clothes rant, preferably to start. Then how to improve hip stabilization to pre prevent knee injury. Yeah, I mean, gym clothes just don't have to overthink it, man. Like you don't have to match it either. I just uh, there's a lot. I had to go, man, I did like this nothing throwaway post about wearing basketball jerseys in the gym and it like kind of got, it went around and it's like the number of people that got so defensive about me making a comparison to like girls that wear Led Zeppelin t-shirts and guys that wear <laughs> basketball jerseys. I was like, okay, like I get it. Like you wear a basketball jersey. That's fine. Uh, I, yeah, I just, I don't know. Like I feel like if I'm in an environment where I'm trying to learn. I think the easiest way, to, like Jane Goodall didn't go observe the chimps and wear like a grimace costume, right? She kind of kept it low key. So it's like, if you're, I, don't, I mean, look, whatever, wear whatever the fuck you want. I don't really give a shit. It's just nothing says rookie in my eyes. Like, and, and there's obvious exceptions to the rule. Sonny Webster wears neon tights and shit. Sonny's like one of the best lifters on the planet. But like, I, I just... Don't draw attention to yourself maybe as a general rule as a person that I've just grew up with. Like I grew up very untrusting of other people and I, I grew up with the, the loudest that the loudest guy in the room is the weakest guy in the room. So yeah. if your shoelaces are fucking loud, why are you drawing attention to yourself? It's like, cause you're probably in this case weak. So that's, that's my whole thing with neon. It's like, don't draw attention to yourself. I fuck with that. Um, do you, do you want to weigh in on the hip stability and knee stuff? I feel like we've done entire podcasts on that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no, I don't. Sorry. All right. Strength training for senior citizen considerations. Lead-based supplements. I think we have already established that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, so I've worked Strength. with a handful of senior citizens. Uh, and I, uh, I hate to put out facts that I don't fully know. But uh, one of the things that is a predictor of, like, when someone's going to die is the shortening of their gait cycle, right? They start to shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Um, they fall over. They have no hip stability. And that's, that's what it boils down to is they don't have the stability to take a longer stride length. So that's kind of one of the things I've – that's exactly one of the things that I focus on when I work with people that are older. It's like, all right, you have no stability, so you can't move. Your body is just kind of casting itself into this position, 
So we need to get you into a longer stride length and we need to get you to be able to reach overhead and we need to get you to get off the ground. These are kind of like the life things that are going to be most demanding as you get older. So basically just understanding how to stabilize yourself, how to control positions that if they were to get into in day-to-day -day life, they would be in a sacrifice position, getting better control, getting better ownership over that. And that's going to be the thing that keeps them more safe as they're living life on this planet against gravity. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it's just, it's thinking about the inputs more than the outputs, like manage, managing inputs becomes the goal devoid of having an objective output goal. So like, that's, I think when I think about senior citizens and I think about an aging population and training, I think about how much can we tolerate inputs within a training session without really thinking about the goal of strength outputs like you know there's a limited capacity and you see this when you train and i've trained elder, elderly people in the past their fatigue and their fitness are both so low that it doesn't really matter which one you are trying to build. Are you trying to like build a particular adaptation? Well, you probably can't because they don't have enough fitness, right? Can you, can you build enough fitness? Like, well, it takes, it takes so little to actually move the needle, which is a good and a bad thing. So I think for me, it's like, how much stimulus can I throw at them? Sometimes quite literally throw at them. Right? Like there's a lot of cognitive, cognitive aspects to training a, an elderly person where it's like it might look a little bit more like play at a time. It might actually start to resemble something like the, the way you would train a child, just kind of in some weird other side of the bell curve distribution of our you know, um, motor and physical development. It's uh, yeah, I, I think un massively underrated in the pursuit of building st stability in, in this case with the uh, elderly clientele is the use of machines that like, part of the stability as a training adaptation, if we look at like muscle spindle reflexes, muscle spindle reflexes, there's two components to it. There's a nuclear bag fiber, and nuclear chain fiber. One tells you the onset of stretch and the other tells you the duration. And I think what that, those are the mechanisms that are telling us what's heavy, right? Like hey, when I pick up a weight, it's my muscle that tells me it's heavy. I think training on machines can get sometimes pushed aside in the pursuit of like, well, the goal is walking, let's get them assisted in, in those positions. It's like, I think one of the, one of the strongest links to all cause mortality is thigh strength, mm -hmm. knee extensor strength, right? So it's like quad extensions, leg press. These are all tools because that will build the foundational unit of the mu A muscle can't be a sensory organ if it's nothing. Right. So I think, you know, in a weird way, and one of the things just from what I see through the lens of social media, when people are training geriatrics, like they are trying to train them in this external environment, that's just too far afield. You're just, you're kind of just putting them out there in the world, them having to sort out. It's like, that might be too, it might be too of a, too much of a vigilant state for them to be in and actually just teaching a muscle to contract and relax and contract and relax. That is in the early stages, that is still sensory input to them that will translate. They have an awareness. And once they have that base level awareness, let's push that ability for that muscle to be sensitive and aware by giving it a less stable external environment. And so for that, like basically it's the pretext to all the shit we talk about is actually sometimes like, hey, let's get back to strength first, right? Let's get just back to isolated insertion to origin muscle strength in an externally stabilized environment. And then you might be able to get a little bit more purchase or get a little bit more traction when you introduce these things. Cause I think people are like, everyone's cognizant of the problem. Um, but I think the, the, the setting realistic expectations of the solution by like st staggering your approach a little bit. That's why I see a lot of people train old people like unstable young people. And I think that's wrong. I like that. Yeah. Decreasing complexity. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cause the, it's a, it's a bandwidth issue. It's a bandwidth issue of sensory input and that's what you're the problem you're trying to solve. Yeah. I like that. Um, all right. Uh, the fuck spelled D A F U Q. Should we do about bad trainers and coaches though? 
spelled T H O. Nothing. Be a good, be a better one. Yeah. Right. There's nothing I, we can do. It's not like we're Giuliani, like killing homeless people in New York. We're gonna round them all up and like send them on a bus to Arizona. Like I don't know what's yeah. what's what are our options here, dog? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think this goes with one of the questions that was lower down the list. Um, Night of the Living Deadlift. Uh, hey. Willie. Yeah. Willie. Uh, he asked where the industry is heading in the next five to ten years, and I think we're in this. If we could call it, uh, hesitant to say this, but an age of enlightenment in the training space, I think a lot of it, yeah, right. We're we're on. I think we're coming back from that that swing towards like evidence based, like where's your study type shit, back to like somewhere somewhere around best practices, but like combining um, evidence and experience. So I think over the next five to ten years, we're going to see a lot higher level of comp, a lot higher ceiling is what we're going to see in the training industry, which means that the I mean the floor is always going to be the floor. Like there's always going to be trash trainers, but, but I think the the ceiling continues to get higher. And it even goes with one of the questions higher up on the list is not all these people have the the accolades that people might have had ten years ago, right? It's it's not CSCS or or um, like a master's degree in exercise science, but as people that have been doing this for a long period of time, the internet allows us to share information very quickly. And there's a lot of information readily available. So the people that are more able to vet that information, apply that information and sort out what's good and bad is going to continue to drive the profession forward. And I think there's going to be a really high ceiling just in, in the free market space. And like, there's always going to be like the, the good life or the 24 hour fitness that just like has these entry level trainers. But I think there's going to be a lot more of an industry carved out for the, the one-off like one-on-one -on -one online coaches uh, or high end like personal trainers. So I think you're right. I don't think we have to do shit about it. Just keep getting better at what you do. And there's going to be more access to better trainers that it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah, I think <clears throat> the number of people moving into the industry on the provider side will continue to increase. I think our ratios will stay the same. I think all the trash trainers will just be new trainers. Right. I don't think you're, you, 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 I think people are seeing now in our lifetime the, the needing this to evolve as a coach and continue to upskill, which, you know, we have people who are a little bit further on in their career who find us who might be the, the only new ethos that they've developed in 20 years or like been open to um, where it's like, you're going to have to be open to you know, one. I think if you're open to under, knowing that you don't know it all out of the gate, that's super useful. But there was a time where that wasn't the case relative to what was available. If you knew 1% more, the, the baseline of the people you were comparing that 1% to was never moving. But thanks to guys like Huberman and maybe us, that the, the accessibility for the, the consumer to get smarter, to be more informed is pushing it so that if you want to stay in this industry and stay relevant in the industry, you have to be, you know, that's now a moving target where like before you could just, just get your certification, train a few people, and then kind of be comfortable in the fact that your consumer base was not going to really get smarter about the stuff that you know. That's not the case. So it's keeping us sharp. What I think is going to replace the um, uh, the evidence based crowd is technology. This mm -hmm. is where this is our new enemy at the gates for those who have been in the trenches for two decades. Yeah. Is it being able to you know when, when someone comes in like oh there's a study that did this. What we are now going to be looking at is there's a the my app told me this. Right. right. My the data says my data says this. So a similar type of problem that we're going to be up against. What I say in the next 10 years, the biggest issue that, you know, a competent, aware trainer that has experience and can recognize patterns and understands mechanisms. The biggest issue they're going to have is combating the the, the AGI data that people are going to have access to that informs them about technique or health or reps or all that. So it's going to be annoying more annoying because it's going to be real time right yeah. journals get published on a on a cadence and these things give us a little bit of time to reprieve in between but you're going to be the inundation of uh, and i hate to use the word mis misinformation but i think that's the new that's the next frontier is like okay if you want to be a really good coach you have to be 
you know, be able to explain your way through not only research, that generation has passed. Okay. If you can't fucking talk your way around, you know, if you can't do a true evidence base using your own experience of why a ketogenic diet might not be the best or might be the best or, you know, being able to layer context, you're going to be really on your heels when people start coming in with, with fitness apps and wearables. And we have conversations behind the scenes with people looking to develop this stuff. It's here. And yeah. you got to be ready for it because it's it's a little bit more clever than the stuff that we're used to having to combat against, which is abstracts and poor research articles. Yeah, yeah. I think the baseline's still going to be shit trainers. Like they're going to be they're going to be on the floor. I think technology's probably very soon going to surpass what they're capable of doing. But I think that the capability of a good trainer will always be above technology. All right. Uh, experience working with people who had a weird foot injury. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot. <laughs> Liz, Liz, Liz Franks and Jones fractures are probably, if you look at the statistics, and I could pull it up because I have the statistic, um, are, are really tough. They're career ending injuries. They are probably um, injury st stats. Uh, they are probably the. Uh, one injury that when people get them, as far as I'm talking primarily about football, um, well, let me see if any injury tracks higher than, yeah, I mean, spine injuries are, okay, so for a linebacker, so we gauge severity by average weeks missed per injury. And we're totaling this data across, uh, I mean, this data is almost 20 years worth of data. Um, so for a linebacker, the most amount of games missed due to a single injury is a Liz Frank injury of the foot. Um, and that comes in in the last 25 years, just under, let's just say just a hair under 1,400 total man games lost. If you can think about that. Sounds like a lot. So, I mean, think there's 17 games a season or whatever the fuck, right? Plus playoffs. The number of times a Liz Frank injury. So if you have you know, X number of linebackers across the league, how many linebackers have to miss how many games in 25 years to make up 1,400 games? So, yeah, the feet injury are tough because a rehab is the worst. That's, what, that's honestly what it boils down to because we people – the uh, the understanding of basic load management principles in foot rehab doesn't it is there's so there's such a gap in logic like because it's the thing that's going to bear the the entire brunt of the skeletal weight and the you know the, the weight of the skeleton and the muscle and everything like you know a shoulder rehab is very uh measured and calculated because other than the, a little bit of axial distraction forces due to gravity and the weight of the arm, there's minimal force required of the shoulder. And if there is, and it's intolerant to the state of the tissue, we can put it in a sling or a brace. So we decide. But with feet injuries, a lot of times, like here you have a, tish, a tissue that's completely intolerant to load, or Liz Frank or Jones, um, or even you know, toe stuff, hammer toes, turf toes, things like that completely intolerant to load. So say you have a foot and a shoulder that are completely intolerant to load and you can start to gauge the the amount of load in the shoulder very strategically. You can put it in a sling and a brace and it doesn't get loaded until you say so. You put it in a boot, guy has crutches, maybe he forgets him one day and then he goes to like that to hobbling on, on the boot. It's like there's still pressure going through that foot no matter how much you have it casted. Like, you know, wheelchairs honestly don't get used nearly enough for as long, which as fucked up as that sound, 1,400 man games lost for one position. And Liz Franks are super common with offensive linemen as well. And the issue is with the O-linemen, especially, and the linebackers, they have, on average are that on the heavier end of players on the field. When you go from crutches to weight-bearing, that's like me from going from an empty bar to 315 on a bench. Mm -hmm. That's a massive increase in load to a tissue that has to more or less tolerate all of it, right? So other, other areas of the body, everything more, you know, uh, superior, I guess, as, as far as using superior and inferior distal to proximal, everything higher up the chain has the ability to be strategically underloaded. So 
you know, what people do with foot rehab is they do, you know, little towel, scrunchy, intrinsic foot muscle exercises. But unless what you're strengthening against can scale to two, 300 pounds, the second that person stands on that leg, all of the motor relearning or foot strengthening that you've been doing is kind of useless compared to what that tissue now has to manage when a 240 pound man is like upright and ambulatory taking his entire body weight on one foot. So yeah, they're, they're tough and it's, it's no different a principle than any other injury. It's just, you need to, you need to be able to see what, where the load is coming from. And the body weight is a, is a default metric that not a lot of people factor into the equation. I think, uh, and I think you said it, you mentioned it in there somewhere, but something that's a heavy consideration for me is how long they're non weight bearing on that side. Uh, because that's a period of time where they're having essentially no proprioceptive awareness of how to coordinate the musculature for that entire limb, right? They're, they're developing, they're adapting towards this compensation pattern where their weight, bat, their weight bearing strategy is so abnormal to what they typically do or what would be ideal, especially in sport, but even in like day-to-day -day life in terms of symmetry, that your, the only input they're getting is something that's going to lead to greater dysfunction down the road if, it's not, if there's not intervention around that pretty much immediately. So that's what I start to look towards when it comes to rehab like this is, all right, we know this happened. We know that you're going to be non-weight bearing for this period of time. What can we do now to have an effect on cleaning up some of the stuff that we know is going to happen if we don't intervene sooner rather than later? So that's that's a heavy consideration for me. It's just what, how long are they non-weight bearing? How long is that foot off of the ground? And then what are going, what are the repercussions going to be from that if we just leave it untended to for the next six to eight weeks until they can get both feet on the ground? Because if you wait eight weeks before you start doing things to address that stuff, then you have so much time, you have so much adaptation that you're already working against that it's going to be something that's going to be a lot longer standing when you get them back to weight bearing. Water is the goat rehab tool and probably one of the mm, best yeah. training tools that you have in, if, because again, it's gravity, right? No one factors in the weight of the athlete. No one's act, no one is actually calculating athletic training volume, in my opinion, because no one factors in the weight of the athlete, mm. right? And it's tough. You know, you have, you're running stations, six guys per rack, fucking 54 guys in a weight room. You know, you have a variance from 165 pounds up to 410. And you got a couple bars loaded, but it's like, man, every extra pound, I think of like every chiropractor in his office has some bullshit fucking PDF printed of like a head position that's carried forward <laughs> and how much actual stress is on the neck for every like degree your head carries forward. And it's like, substitute degrees with pounds of body weight and then add and replace stress on the neck or stress on your joints. Now, mind you, there's a certain threshold for joints to withstand stress that scales sublinearly, let's say with body weight. Um, but you know, you have to factor in the, how heavy the person is. Now that's something you always have to factor in. Like what is gravity's role in this, right? It's like, um, it's, it's like I used to, I've met no kids who would factor in the weight of like the sled on a, on a leg press to their leg press numbers. It's like, why don't you just measure your dick in centimeters and just get it over with? Like, what are you, <laughs> why are you like, who, who has a 417 pound leg press? What do you mean? It's like, well, yeah, like the thing is, says it's 112 pounds. And it's like, okay, in, in this comparison, it like kind of makes sense. I'm like, you need to factor in how heavy the person is. And if you have, if you're dealing with a foot injury, and it's early stages and you're pre weight bearing, you're pre weight bearing on this planet, but maybe you're not weight bearing or pre weight bearing on the moon, which like, I think the moon is six times less the force of gravity. There's still gravity, obviously. And that's if you believe we got to the moon uh, and that's maybe a time for an, or a topic for another podcast. But if that's like maybe water could, maybe you're weight bearing ready, you're ready to be weight bearing on another planet and then just create that environment and the depth of the water creates that scaled resistance right so throw them in the fucking deep end and have them just like moving their foot around against just the resistance of water and then yeah. move them to a point where they're fucking they're, they're got a snorkel on and they're standing on the, it's like yeah they're way more buoyant in that position but as you bring the water down gravity starts to act more and then by the time they're you know walking around and they're in knee high water it's like you're basically now you're ready to get them back into like 
have them walking on sand, build up some of the muscle, have them walking on grass, then have them walking on, uh, you know, some sort of mondo and then cement. It's like scaling that force demand from the weight or from the weight of the earth pushing back up rather than just focusing on the force of the body pushing it back down. Anyways, I like that question. Yeah, that was good. And what I took from that is that we're going to do mushrooms in a pool and record a podcast about being on the moon one day. That's what, that's what I said. That's, yeah, definitely, that's, that's what I heard. <laughs> that's definitely what I said. Uh, you know, the worst right. part about this What's is that? we did. I thought we were going to answer a few and then get in. So we'll do an entire episode for the winner, <laughs> which will be the violent patience. But we're an hour yeah. into this. All right. So what we got. Yeah. Let's go a few more. Uh, yeah. I mean, that was the next one was the violent patients training versus exercise and appropriate expectations outcomes from each. You want to save that for another episode? I think he gets a whole episode. That's All how right. the winner works. That's how and the winner we'll do, works. We'll do a Q and a, I'll throw mine up this week. And it will, if you guys like this as a segment, we'll, I, I don't think we roasted that many questions. I thought we were, we were uh, so, so I skipped a couple of the dumb ones. I, we can go back if you want. I mean, all right, let's, let's do a couple minutes of dumb ones. Let's roast people so they know how to ask good questions. All right, let me scroll back a bit. Um, let's see. I mean, a, oh boy. Right. A lot of these are just not even questions. Like one says men's health. Uh, not, uh, yeah, relationship advice. We're just never going to do that on here. No. Um, no. You know exactly what you should be talking about. I don't even know what that means. Sounds like a threat. Fuck you, man. <laughs> yeah, right. Like you, you think you think I know anything? Dude, Fuck you. <laughs> do you know how many people I figured out where they lived this week on the internet? <laughs> There's a few yeah. people who I'm, I'm going to visit their gyms. Dude, and, I guarantee. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guarantee we could figure out where every single one of these people live. Just yeah. So, yeah. so keep that I, in mind if you're in the question box. I'm petty and I have the means to do this. Like, I, <laughs> sorry, there is actually one guy. I was talking to Jorge about it. <laughs> We're just going. Right, I will save this for off air. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great, can't uh, wait. Can't wait for this episode to get subpoenaed. That'll be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We haven't mentioned pipe bombs yet, but that yeah. doesn't that doesn't count because sh- I said we haven't mentioned them. Right. Uh, yeah. Alleged. Allegedly. Yeah. Jorge asking why my arms won't grow. Yo, Jorge. Yo. Just wait. We know we know where you live, Jorge. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. yeah the, uh, at, at the judge's house, which we will not be visiting. Yeah. Um, uh, Benson Robles wants to be the third Jordan. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know what to say to that. What, are you okay? Like, did, are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Just be the first Benson Robles. Come on, man. Dude, it's he's not just man. like more than I can he's, squat. He's, yeah, he's the man. Um, cold tubs and Theraguns as a statement. Uh, very different. Yeah, very different. I think cold tubs are cold tubs are kind of like the Turkish getups of modalities. That once you're good at them, you don't have to do them. Not that you don't have to do them, and like there's obviously a point where they're always difficult. But I think the net there's a depreciating. Um, there's a depreciating ROI on your time if it's a daily thing, I think. Because I think the benefits are massively swung to some sort of metabolic. Everyone focuses on cold shock proteins and all this. I think it's way more, I think it's way higher level. Like I look at um, the, the backing science behind HRV as so far as I can tell is a principle called uh, respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And that's essentially that arrhythmia. People think arrhythmia bad. They think like heart condition or something like that. Arrhythmia is the difference in heartbeat from, it's essentially the variability component of heart rate variability. So uh, cold plunge, I think, is overprescribed, um, under, overprescribed and misunderstood, not useless, but just. Yeah, overprescribed and misunderstood. And the, the overprescription comes from a misunderstanding. Like anything, right? I think it's fitness has a way of just finding novelty in something and then and then cr- creating a dose response relationship to yes. the intervention. Mm-hmm. If some is good, more is better. It's like that's not how anything works. Right? Right. So yeah, if air guns, I think are are, are a light lift. Keep them around if you like them. 
most people have a positive response to them, but they are a very, very small part of a very, very big picture, but different mechanistically that those two are two different pictures in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And a good point there that I think people misunderstand like the, um, the magnitude of usefulness of a lot of these things, like how is this? Like uh, antibiotics kill bacteria. People, people tell me to put tea tree oil on my dog to kill bacteria. Like if, if you have an infected cut and you're going septic, you're not going to put tea tree oil on it. You're going to take some fucking IV antibiotics, right? Like understanding that each of these things, there's, there's going to be some sort of return on it. And there's a lot more things that you could be maximizing before some of these things become the right option. And there are some people that, yeah, they have everything up to par. They're doing everything right. And maybe it's time to add these things in just for a little bit more to maximize, I guess we could say. So they can maximize everything that they're doing. And the mental side of it is helpful with some of this stuff. But if you're fucking, we're about to amputate from the elbow down, take the fucking antibiotics. Like go to sleep an hour earlier and none of these conversations need to exist. Right. And now those watching, you don't see Jay's cauliflower ear. Someone who's, yeah, yes. that's a guy who knows the things about antibiotics, right? Because <laughs> when you've been in that close of contact, so every, 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 every wrestler I know is a low-key dermatologist. And, 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 tell, me I'm not, tell me I'm not lying. Dude, my freshman year in high school, my yearbook picture, I have a fucking, I have ringworm <laughs> right on my fucking forehead. Oh my God. If anyone has this that's listening, send it to me. Oh my God. But <laughs> case in point, right? Like no one, no fucking grizzled old Pennsylvania wrestling coach is going to be like, oh, I got your teacher oil right here. Yeah. He's like, oh, I had a wild weekend last week. Oh, there's a Z pack in here somewhere. <laughs> like, <laughs> Shout out Huberman. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Done. Done. <laughs> Episode over. <laughs> RX Radio. Hey, if you want, there's more of this in Prescript Level 1. So, yeah. Actually, I don't even know if I want to plug the company after that. That was unbelievable. Yeah. I'm just going to stop it.